Hello there. Welcome to this graduate course on the teaching of St. Thomas Aquinas on the good, the bad, the beautiful, and the ugly. Uh, many of you, those uh, who are taking the course uh, this semester uh, have taken my course already on the, the one and the many uh, in St. Thomas and uh, the metaphysics course. And so you have some familiarity with my background. For those of you who have no familiarity with it, I'm a uh, retired professor of philosophy from St. John's University in New York. I'm rector of the Adler Aquinas Institute and a senior fellow at the Center for the Study of the Great Ideas and also the CEO of a company called the uh, Aquinas School of Leadership, uh, as well as uh, doing adjunct teaching presently for Holy Apostles College and Seminary in Cromwell, Connecticut. Uh, the um, I've been teaching on the uh, the university level, college level, for over 45 years. I have a specialization in St. Thomas, as well as in the, the history of, of uh, philosophy, uh, or what I think is would be better called a, a Western intellectual history, because uh, uh, most of uh, Western intellectual history uh, uh, considers aspects of, of uh, intellectual work that are non-philosophical. Uh, what I want to do is start out this course the way I'd start out every course, uh, pretty much, that I've taught uh, for a number of years. Uh, at least within the, say, last 20 years uh, or 30 years I was doing teaching on campus. And that is to ask, ask you five students, uh, <laughs> ask you five questions. Um, uh, the, uh, the first of which is uh, precisely who are you? All of the questions are precise. Precisely who are you? Uh, where are you? How did you get here? Uh, why are you chiefly here? And uh, where are you going from here? Now, I ask you these questions because uh, the, the only way people can communicate effectively, uh, one with another, uh, is to the extent that they, they share a common interest. They share, they share something in common uh, to, the, to the sense that, as people would say today, that they're on the same page or uh, that uh, the, uh, they have a sense of belonging to the same organization and have the same end. Huh? Uh, the, uh, whenever I come into a new situation, whenever anybody comes into a new situation, we're coming into a situation with which we're somewhat unfamiliar, unfamiliar territory. Uh, and so I, I consider that as a kind of territory where I'm, I'm lost. Uh, and uh, to, to figure out how to, uh, how to, pro how to progress uh, when I, we, there's more than one individual and we have to cooperate uh, is to figure out um, uh, how uh, we share some sort of a, a common interest, a common aim. Uh, and uh, that puts us into a kind of an organizational, what St. Thomas would call a, a genus. Uh, because it's only it's only within the context of a genus that uh, or an organization we can start to make comparisons uh, uh, that relate uh, to uh, uh, to a common activity. Uh, uh, if uh, if we have no common activity, uh, then the comparisons that, that we make and uh, and what we more or less try to do is just not going to be uh, headed in the same direction. So. Um, the, uh, I, re I ask you these questions because people have different purposes, different chief aims for why they're taking a course. Uh, some do it for economic reasons, they might want economic advances, advancements, some, some do it because they're interested in acquiring information or improving their understanding. Some people do take classes for enjoyment, huh? uh, and, um, uh, it's the same thing with respect to teaching classes. Uh, I consider myself simply to be a better student, and my chief aim in conducting a course 
uh, is to uh, get at the truth of things uh, for the purpose of helping me to improve my life, to, to live a happier life. Uh, and along the way, uh, if there are other purposes for which the Course is designed, huh? Uh, to to also uh, include those as part of the chief aim. Huh? Uh, so uh, if I were doing this course, uh, for example, uh, for uh, purposes of executive training, and not only would I want to make people happy, but I want to make people happier, uh, happy and happier, uh, in their professional life, huh? uh, so that getting at the truth of things uh, would uh, would improve their ability uh, to do a particular type of work. Uh, which might be the aim for you, for you taking this class, for example. You might you might want to do it to improve your skills at uh, uh, at understanding um, uh, how to uh, how to engage in uh, more prudent uh, decision making, or uh, uh, to uh, uh, to understand your emotions better, um, uh, to uh, uh, get get a better appreciation of. Uh, of objects and their weaknesses and strengths, um, all of which are, we'll cover to some extent in this uh, in this class. So, um, but uh, if you're if so, if you're not chiefly here uh, uh, for the purpose of improving your life uh, and improving it uh, just in general or in, in a professional capacity, uh, but for some other reason, well, how, whatever your chief purpose is, your chief aim. Is going to determine how much you're going to get out of the class, okay? Uh, and it's just something I like to have students think about before going on because uh, we're going to be spending a lot of time in this course, and um, I prefer you not to not to waste your time because time is uh, is, is valuable. And um, the um, I also like when I start a course to make reference to two two quotes that. Uh, continually help me to focus on what I'm doing. One is this citation from Aristotle uh, that he gives in On the Heavens and the Earth that uh, uh, small mistakes in the beginning tend to lead uh, to larger mistakes, more numerous mistakes down the road. Uh, and a quote from the great uh, Catholic intellectual Etienne Gelson uh, uh, who, who said that uh, most philosophical mistakes start from badly framed questions. Okay, so uh, I want to I want to I want to start this course huh, by uh, uh, making sure that we're not making any small mistakes in the beginning. And uh, the best way to do that is to ask the right questions. Now, uh, in proceeding to to deal with the question of the good, the bad, the beautiful, and the ugly. Right, um, in this first class, what I'm going to do right at this this first uh, this, this first of two videos. Every week we'll have uh, this, the, the lectures uh, will be divided into two videos, uh, so that uh, we're not spending an entire uh, an entire class on a 50 minute video, but uh, a 25, 30 minute, maybe 35 minute video, and then coming back to do another video. Uh, the um, Starting this this course on the good, the bad, the beautiful, and the ugly, uh, since St. Thomas Aquinas was a theologian and he focused attention on uh, uh, studying topics uh, from the standpoint of theology, uh, chiefly, I want to I want to start with what he has to say about uh, the office of the wise man, since this is a course in philosophy. Huh? Uh, and St. Thomas thought that the job of the philosopher as well as of the theologian uh, was the pursuit of wisdom. To, to start with what he says at the beginning of his, uh, uh, his um, masterful uh, Summa Contra Gentiles, uh, where he says that the, the, the business of the, of the, uh, the philosopher, uh, according to both Aristotle and what the many say, what most people say, uh, is uh, uh, to set things in order and govern them well. Huh? That is, a person who's pursuing wisdom is, is in some, to some extent interested in order. Huh? 
is interested in a relation of parts and wholes and, and wants to know uh, how the parts and wholes are related to uh, an end. Right. Now, it, the reason that St. Thomas refers to the, to the many is because all, <laughs> for two reasons at least, one is for, because for him the study of philosophy as it was for the ancient Greeks always involves the study of the one and the many. Uh, and what the many say about things, both St. Thomas and Aristotle taught, they could not be totally wrong, and that the way we chiefly tend to name things, at least not in a non-professional way at the beginning, is by taking an, uh, uh, the, the way things are named from the way most people uh, refer to them. Uh, the, um, now, uh, in saying that the office of the wise man is to, is to, to set things in order and govern them well, to understand the nature of order, St. Thomas says, well, we chiefly get our understanding of order from an, an end. Huh? And this notion of an end is, uh, is widely misunderstood both in the teaching of Aristotle and in the teaching of St. Thomas. Uh, what they mean by an end uh, is an initial act uh, that's what well, today we would call an external stimulus, uh, uh, either for a... Uh, uh, some sort of existing thing or for a human being. Uh, ends for human beings or aims they call purposes. Uh -huh. uh, but they don't consider inanimate beings to have purposes. But in, inanimate beings do have, do have ends uh, uh, in the sense that they have external stimuli uh, which affect their internal organization. Uh, and uh, the, uh, with respect to human beings, uh, the end is this, an external stimulus that motivates, that causes a subject to move toward it, uh, to attract it uh, uh, as a, a, uh, to, uh, a, a subject in, with which it, wants to, it seeks to be united. Uh, for example, the chief end of, uh, of firefighters is to put out the fire. Uh, if, they, if, if people have no interest in fighting fires, and, and if their cooperative less act is not to put out the fire, then they can never, they can never cooperate in an orderly way. Huh? So uh, wherever St. Thomas and Aristotle find a multitude of beings acting cooperatively huh? uh, to generate a single act, that last act is their first in intention. It's what they first seek to do. Huh? Without the external stimulus, there is no unification of this multitude to become parts of a whole. Huh? And when St. Thomas and Aristotle are talking about uh, uh, the, the natures of things, what they're chiefly talking about is what today we call an organization. Huh? A multitude made up of parts, and parts cannot exist unless there's a relationship between or among members of a multitude and a common act. Huh? Uh, uh, disconnected huh? uh, uh, multitudes, huh? multitudes that have no relationship to a common action are not parts of a whole. Huh? If you have parts of a whole, you have an aim. Uh -huh. The aim exists in the beginning. Right? It's there right from the very start. Uh, just as St. Thomas would consider a, a maturely developed person, human being, uh, uh, to, to be present in an immaturely developed way right from the beginning in a uh, in a human being, or a person who's seeking to drive uh, from New York City to Buffalo, New York. Uh, Buffalo, New York is in the beginning uh, as part of, the, uh, of this operation, huh? uh, this organizational activity. Uh, if it's not there from the start, then you have a different activity. Right? But any singular act that's composite has an aim, something that has that, that has motivated, moved, huh? a multitude 
to be attracted toward it and has established a relationship among the parts, uh, among the multitude, to transform them into parts of a whole. So St. Thomas says that we, we, we take the rule of government, uh, the order for all things directed toward an end, from the end, from what's externally stimulating us in the beginning. Uh, that can be a conscious object of desire, right? uh, or it could be some, something else that's exercising a kind of magnetic attraction on something. Huh? But the union with the end right, uh, is, what, is, is what interests uh, 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 people who are concerned about order. Huh? Uh, and uh, that's one of the, the chief elements that they, they seek to understand. Uh, the, um, St. Thomas also maintains that everything uh, is best disposed or ordered uh, uh, when it is fittingly or proportionately ordered to its end, when its parts, that is, are unequally ordered. Uh, now this this notion of being proportionately ordered is very is is very important. Uh, Saint Thomas will use this notion of proportion uh, repeatedly uh, throughout uh, in, uh, different writings, uh, and he'll refer to it in other terms like suit, suitable or fitting, huh? uh, because nothing uh, moves uh, toward something. Uh, that uh, it does not have the power in some way to, to be attracted towards or be attracted by. Huh? Uh, St. Thomas will call that a proportionate uh, kind of, uh, of, of relationship. Hmm? Uh, wherever you, you have a, an agent and something being acted upon where one is stimulating the other, there has to be some sort of proportion, huh? some sort of equality uh, between the giver uh, and the receiver. Huh? Uh, and uh, because he says that everything that is best disposed or ordered is done so by having an inequality huh, of the relationship among the parts, he's saying that, that things are best ordered when they are uh, uh, me members, parts of a composite whole or an organization. So basically when he's, he's, he's saying that the office of the wise man is to set things in order and govern them well, what he's saying is the, uh, the office of a person who has wisdom uh, is, to, is to be able to establish organizations huh? uh, and to, to understand their natures, right? to, understand, to understand what makes them to be organizations. In fact, I maintain that the ancient Greeks themselves, this was their chief area of interest in doing philosophy. The problem of the one and the many for the ancient Greeks was not simply a, a problem for ancient physicists. It was the problem of ancient philosophy and trying to understand uh, what are organizations? How do organizations differ one from another? Uh, what holds them together? Uh, what causes them to be broken apart? Uh, uh, unity holds them together in some way, and unity for the ancient Greeks was chiefly a quality. Hmm? Uh, and organizations differ on the basis of the quality of unity that causes them to be united, uh, which quality in a way gives them their good. So there's a direct connection between the study of the problem, the one and the many, and the study of the, uh, the good, the bad, the beautiful, uh, and the ugly. Uh, now. Uh, according to St. Thomas, because all things are, are, are best disposed when they're fittingly or proportionately ordered, uh, uh, the, um, uh, what uh, the holes that are, are studied are uh, composed of contraries, of parts that are more or less perfect, uh, unequal parts, uh, uh, somewhat, to some extent, unequal parts uh, that unequally contribute uh, something huh, uh, to uh, the um, uh, the achievement of an end. Um, to say to say that they're unequal doesn't mean doesn't mean that they don't contribute something uh, uh, that uh, is significantly important uh, to the the achievement of an act. Huh? 
uh, the person, for example, who's carrying out a, um, a an activity that is not that of a commanding general, uh, nonetheless in tactical operations, it will win a victory huh? uh, for a, an army huh? uh, and will be doing something that perhaps the general couldn't do. Right? Uh, the general commands in a more, in a more general way. Huh? The, uh, uh, the, the person on the, uh, in, the, in the field, the sergeant, uh, for example, commands uh, uh, in, a, in a more individual way and does something that the general couldn't. But the, po the point is that their expertise uh, has to be unequal uh, uh, and unequal in its, its own perfections uh, to contribute to the, the harmonious operation of the whole. Uh, so... Uh, because of this, he, he maintains that arts are architectonically arranged. Huh? Um, one is the means to the good of the other, um, as uh, one art uh, acts for the end of another. Uh, uh, Aristotle gives this example where he says that the, uh, the art of use governs uh, uh, the, the art of producing. Huh? Uh, that is the art of the art of sailing uh, governs the art of shipbuilding, and uh, which is uh, uh, one of the examples that uh, that Saint Thomas gives, or how the art of horsemanship uh, uh, governs the art of weapons production. That, that of, of someone who who uh, is an equestrian uh, in a in an army, uh, uh, or uh, the. Um, uh, as I've already mentioned, the art of use governs uh, any art of production. Now, the arts that govern the ends of the particular generic holes, he says, uh, um, reaches uh, that the, the uh, none of the arts, he says, that um, uh, govern the ends of the particular gener generic holes uh, reaches the end of all generic holes. Uh, uh, none of the particular arts um, studies uh, the end of the entire universe. Uh, hence, he, he maintains that the wise person uh, uh, in a particular area of study, uh, uh, in, in a particular area of organization, uh, of organizational expertise, is not the absolutely wise person. It's not the person who's unqualifiably wise. Uh, the absolutely wise person, he says, considers the ends of the universe. Right? Uh, and so the best of uh, inquirers, huh? uh, the person who's most scientific and, uh, for St. Thomas is going to be the philosophical metaphysician and the, and the theologian, and absolutely speaking would be uh, the theologian. Huh? And since the end of the intellect, uh, which is uh, the most perfect of, of all uh, agencies within the physical universe is truth, uh, then the end of the wise, the wise man, as he puts it, must be uh, chiefly aimed at understanding truth, and not just this or that truth, but understanding the truth for, the, for which the entire universe exists. Uh, and Aristotle confirms that metaphysics is the science of first truth, uh, the truth that is the origin of all truth. Okay. The, um, the job of every science, then, according to St. Thomas, is actually twofold. Huh? Uh, it's to know the truth, because, Saint, because science studies multitudes, because it studies an organization, and organizations are made of more or less perfect parts, huh? uh, species of, uh, of, um, of members huh? uh, of the organization. Uh, it studies contrary opposites, uh, one which is the most perfect huh? and the, the one which is the least perfect, extremes. And so every science seeks to... Um, uh, understand the truth uh, and uh, promote it, uh, pursue it, as well as to oppose uh, a, an, uh, an error, 
huh? or oppose oppose uh, errors to uh, this chief truth, like the art of medicine, uh -huh, seeks to promote health, uh -huh, and it seeks to, f to fight disease. Uh -huh. uh, every art, according to St. Thomas, considers contraries. It considers a multitude of beings that are related, exist in a relationship toward uh, the, uh, a particular activity. Either that's being observed, uh, in the case of speculative arts and speculative science, or that a person is, or a group of per people are seeking uh, to generate the cause to come into existence. Um, uh, the, um, the metaphysician, especially, he says, has the job to meditate about the nature of truth, belonging to the first truth of everything, to teach this truth to others, and to refute opposing errors. Right. Now, knowing the order of one thing to another, he says, is exclusively that of the intellect, huh? and not of that of the senses. Um, to the extent, to some extent, the senses participate in it, in this, huh? uh, but uh, the the senses report to us the external senses, the way things appear, right? uh, and they have a kind of unity to them. But the external senses, uh, uh, in fact, the external senses apprehend that unity in a kind of generic way. Right? Uh, as St. Thomas says, what we first sense is not this or that uh, individual, like a person like David Hume tends to think, huh? uh, but we first sense is some unfamiliar stuff, huh? an unfamiliar something. Right? And then as we become familiar with it, we get its specific difference and we can define it more precisely. This is why in starting this course, what we're, we're starting with is something that is strange. Uh, our first sensation is, is, is always of something strange, something a little bit alien huh? and unfamiliar because it's not sensed with memory, especially <clears throat> those things which we initially sense as human beings in first coming to know. Um, the, um, now, in a fourfold way, he says, right at the start of uh, his commentary on the, uh, the Nicomachean ethics, uh, that uh, that human reason uh, is um, uh, is is uh, concerned with a fourfold order. Huh? Uh, but that fourfold fourfold order uh, is related to a a more generic order, right? Uh, that exists in everything, uh, or every physical thing, or composite thing. <coughs> he says, of parts to parts, uh, uh, of one part to another, and of the part to a whole. Uh, the, the parts of a whole to the end of a whole, like the parts of a whole army uh, to, uh, to the uh, to the whole army because of the order that's given to the whole army through a commanding general. And this is very important. <coughs> St. Thomas says this at the start of his, his commentary on the Nicomachean Ethics. Um, he makes this observation, right, uh, regarding and, and repeating what's said uh, in, the, um, uh, in his um, uh, Summa Contra Gentilis, that the office of the wise man is to set things in order and govern them well. That uh, the, um, the person who's concerned with ethics, uh, who's concerned with the moral good, is also concerned with part-whole relationships. Or, of, and all science is concerned with <coughs> the relationship of parts to parts and parts to wholes in relationship to a chief act uh, that, is, that is in some way given by an external stimulus to a major part within the organization, a, a commander, uh, the, uh, and is communicated uh, to the multitude because St. Thomas considers all organizations to be communicate what we today would call communications networks. In fact, that's what Aristotle basically understood by a substance. Huh? A substance was a kind of self-arranging organization, huh? a communications network. Uh, that is, is, is developing a relationship among its parts uh, according to a chief activity 
uh, that it seeks to, to generate more than any other kind of activity. Uh, so, uh, the, uh, this commentary on Aristotle's Nicomachean Ethics is a marvelous work for understanding the nature of science as a whole, uh, considered as a whole, philosophy considered as a whole, according to Aristotle and St. Thomas. And uh, it, it seems to me to be a much better representation of what uh, human beings, when they talk about arts and sciences, uh, generally understand arts and sciences to be or to consist in, rather than the kind of narrow reductionistic understanding of, of science that we have, uh, have today, uh, which m tends to reduce it to uh, mathematical physics. So there's a, a fourfold order in things, according to St. Thomas and Aristotle, uh, too. Uh, one, he says, which is we, human beings observant things, uh, but uh, we don't generate in them, uh, we don't cause. Uh, that's a kind of a, a, a speculative order, uh, uh, or theoretical. And then one which we cause in our own acts, uh, which uh, of judging and reasoning when we arrange concepts uh, uh, and signs of concepts among themselves, like in logic, or what St. Thomas, using the term that was common in, at the University of Paris at the time, we call rational philosophy. Uh, but strictly speaking, he didn't consider philosophy, huh? uh, logic being the tool, the tool that the philosopher uses. Uh, and philosophy basically studying the natures of things, huh? uh, according to different habits of mind. And then a third type of order, uh, which uh, we cause in the operations of wills, our wills, which is ethics, huh? and which we cause in external things when producing houses and the like, he says, mechanical arts and fine arts. Huh? So. There's a fourfold way, he says, that order relates to human reason right? with respect to speculation, right? uh, just observing order in things, causing order in things, right? uh, and with respect to logic, causing, causing order in will, chiefly, uh, or in the appetites, in relationship to the ethics, and in relationship to, uh, to practical activities and productions in which we engage. Huh? That's a, a magnificent summary of the whole of artistic activity and scientific activity that, that St. Thomas gives. Huh? Uh, he says that reason is perfected by habit, and especially by the habit of wisdom, huh? uh, through uh, the difficult order in composite wholes that reason considers in particular, uh, reason develops within itself an architecture architectonically arranged order of habits. So, in relationship to the order that exists in things, this, uh, uh, their uh, reason develops, human, the human intellect huh, uh, tends to generate uh, within itself an order of habits that's proportionate in power to the, uh, uh, the, 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 the qualitatively different compositions that exist outside. In things, right? uh, and it's that differentiation within the habits of mind, proportionate, re, proportionately related to the to, to the the qualitatively different composition in things, those qualitatively different wholes, uh, that the divisions and the methods of the sciences uh, develop, develop. The differentiation of the sciences and the arts arises from this architectonic differentiation in habits of the soul, qualities of the soul, that are the means related to perfecting the intellect huh? and grasping the organizational unity that exists in things, which is the truth in things. Huh? Uh, through, this, uh, uh, through this qualitatively different apprehension, the, the, the intellect perfects its own operations qualitatively becomes more virtuous huh? and through the, the uh, uh, it, uh, it's, it, it does this as a result of working uh, through what it observes as order in composite holes and causing order within its own operations 
Just as the subject of physics is the part-whole relationships existing within composite physical wholes ordered toward generating motion, the subject of moral philosophy, he says, is the part-whole relationships existing within human beings that generate voluntary actions. Huh? Hence, ethics does not study vegetative acts, it studies freely chosen acts that makes human beings, properly speaking, specifically human, huh? uh, and involved in human relationships, as Aristotle would say. The, um, so given that as a background, right, I'm going to leave off there uh, and come back and uh, talk to you in a little bit uh, about uh, the meaning of the good. To continue with this discussion of St. Thomas Aquinas on the good, the bad, the beautiful, and the ugly, we covered an introduction, uh, some background information, uh, and then went into a discussion of the business of the philosopher according to St. Thomas. And we examined that from the perspective of a theologian, uh, because uh, the method of the theologian is to start with God and then reason to the world. and. The method of the, the philosopher classically understood, the way the ancient Greeks understood it, is to go from the world to a first principle, to wonder about the being of things, uh, and then from an, a, a, um, an exposure to, uh, uh, to paradoxical um, uh, situations, to contrary opposition, to, uh, to apparent contradictions, to try to a reason out how the, these these contradictions in some way apparent contradictions uh, are not really contradictory if we would approach the study of good philosophically the way the ancient Greeks arrived at it we we would first experience the world to a certain extent as chaotic huh? and uh, disordered uh, but nonetheless possessing order and we would wonder about uh, what it is that exists within that thing that causes the wonder, uh, I mean, causes the order. St. Thomas has no, no, no uh, wonder about this. Uh, as a, a uh, Roman Catholic theologian, he knows that uh, God is the cause of all the, the order in the universe and is also the cause of all goodness and all diversity uh, in things. Um, so, uh, because of the fact too that we're we're examining this uh, this uh, this course against the background of seeking happiness, huh? it makes sense to start with St. Thomas's works where he talks about uh, uh, the pursuit of happiness being related to the pursuit of the good, right? uh, and how the 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 person who's most possessed uh, of uh, the desire to pursue happiness, the wise man, uh, uh, as St. Thomas calls this person, uh, in, uh, in, in a metaphysical sense, uh, who seeks after the truth and who seeks simultaneously in a practical sense to be prudent, uh, is, the, um, uh, is the model of, uh, of wisdom uh, in the, the universe of St. Thomas. So, um, having examined how uh, the, the notion of the wise person relates to uh, the topic of the good and introduces it to us in its widest extent huh? in relationship to everything around us. Um, the, um, uh, when, uh, we then uh, proceeded uh, to talk about um, uh, the fact that the, the, there are different orders of good huh? uh, within, within things that are, are considered uh, by different arts and sciences. Uh, and uh, uh, we left off um, on uh, uh, the uh, consideration of how all science, uh, every art, is concerned with part-whole relationships. Huh? Uh, the relationship of one part to another part and all of the parts to a whole uh, in relationship to a, an external stimulus that acts as a formal object, huh? which uh, St. Thomas would call the good. Huh? So in pursuing an end, uh, St. Thomas, Aristotle, always think that something is pursuing its good huh? because it's pursuing that which made it active, huh? uh, the, that which is giving order to 
to the operations that a thing is performing because until a thing is active, uh, it has no operations. And its operations are, are not chaotic. Uh, its operations uh, occur uh, within a sequence, uh, within an ordering, uh, a harmonization of parts, um, which is evident both to Aristotle and to St. Thomas. So right now we're going to pick up uh, with the, the third, uh, well, actually the fourth topic, uh, considering the introduction, which is the meaning of good considered in general, uh, and uh, follow that up with the, uh, a, an examination of the goodness of God, forms as likenesses of divine perfection, uh, and form as a, uh, the form of a composite whole as a generating principle of order uh, existing in and through the arrangements of a composite's parts. Divine perfection, goodness, and beauty as the cause of all uh, perfection, existence, uh, beauty, uh, plurality, and diversity, harmony in the universe. Uh, and now unequal having as the cause of all plurality, difference, and order uh, in the um, uh, in, uh, exists in genera and species uh, within the universe. So, quite a number of topics, and I'm sure it's going to take us about 40 minutes to go through this, too, uh, if we're lucky. Huh? Uh, but not to worry. Uh, it's, uh, as, as we go over this, you'll see, uh, considering this from the standpoint of the theologian, huh? uh, how uh, these, these terms that St. Thomas uses philosophically, uh, uh, using the the vocabulary of Aristotle um, uh, are much easier to comprehend. Uh, forms like uh, uh, terms like a form, for example. Um, the uh, uh, as, as Saint Thomas understood the term good, huh? good and being, or what in Latin he calls ends, uh, are identical. He says that ends is that which first falls into the intellect. It's the first concept that intellectually uh, the, uh, we, we form. Uh, uh, but, uh, uh, so, but he says, outside of the mind, being and good are identical. Uh, and ends for St. Thomas, uh, which is the, it, what activates our intellect, just like color activates our power of sight, or sound activates our power of hearing. Huh? Uh, being um, is that to which our intellect responds to the extent that we apprehend something as existing. Right? Uh, uh, we, uh, we react to it. Huh? Uh, our mind becomes active. Uh, our mind uh, uh, takes on a, an identity uh, as uh, a, um, uh, a, a kind of nature, an intellectual nature. Uh, uh, independently of that, uh, uh, we uh, we ex the, the intellect exists in a kind of imperfect uh, form of, of being. Uh, just like w when you don't see, uh, or if you totally lack the capacity to see uh, because of some sort of organic damage, uh, there, would be some, uh, there would be something incomplete uh, from the standpoint of your being a composite whole. And this, it, this notion of being a whole or being a composite whole is chiefly what uh, St. Thomas identifies uh, good with. Huh? Uh, being and good uh, are identical in this respect, but good takes on the additional notion for St. Thomas of perfection. Uh, according to him, what causes something to be good is precisely the fact that it's desired or desirable following Aristotle. Uh, but what makes something desired or desirable is is the fact that it's whole. Huh? When we're talking about a composite whole, we mean it's got all of the parts uh, which uh, it needs uh, in order to be the whole that it is, uh, and they are related in such a fashion as to be, ena be enable uh, this whole to be a whole, for the parts to be parts. Huh? So. Uh, the um, uh, he he talks about uh, the, the notion of good in terms of sharing and perfection, right? uh, and a lot of times today people don't like that idea of perfection. We'll talk very often about there being imperfections around us all over the place, 
uh, and how they could we, this would make sense without there being perfections uh, um, is 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 puzzling. But uh, in in the uh, to the ear of Saint Thomas, the term perfect simply means complete, huh? and uh, and and um, anything which has all of the parts uh, to it, which which gives it the unity or identity that it needs in order to be operative, huh? uh, is that which makes it perfect in the sense of being complete. Huh? That's why Aristotle says that uh, a, a substance uh, uh, cannot, strictly speaking, exist unless it has uh, all of the parts uh, that uh, enable it to be a substance because it can't be operative. Huh? It, can't be, it can't engage in action. Uh, it can't do things unless it's, it's complete or whole huh? uh, in its being. But uh, because of the fact that... Uh, uh, the uh, the notion of good huh, uh, adds to a being um, uh, the 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 notion of uh, of of being complete not being incomplete it functions somewhat like the principle of unity does huh? where Saint Thomas says that unity we get the idea of unity from recognizing that something resists the the visibility huh. Uh, well, uh, that which that which makes something desirable is the fact that that's, there's something in it huh? that is resisting uh, uh, being uh, being fragmented uh, or or or, or uh, having its parts separated so that it does not function harmoniously huh? uh, as an organized whole, hmm? and uh, the, uh, the the good of the thing. Uh, in as much as, or the being of a thing, in as much as we grasp it, huh, as as activating our uh, our appetites, and chiefly our will, uh, uh, is what differentiates differentiates it from being, which is the formal object of the will. I mean, of the intellect. Huh? Uh, so, uh, uh, in, in a way. Uh, and the, the good for St. Thomas, uh, since it fulfills the natural desire of the intellect to know truth, uh, uh, I, I'm, I'm sorry, since the, since the truth fulfills the natural desire of the intellect huh, uh, to know uh, the, the, tr the truth of a thing, huh, uh, which consists in, in its, its, uh, its, its completeness of, of internal parts and organization huh, uh, in the thing, uh, just considered as a, you know as 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 being the principles that uh, hold the thing together and unite it. Uh, that truth uh, is the good of the intellect. To the extent that we know the principles huh, uh, that uh, that are contained within a a, a composite whole huh, uh, that that generated as being whole and relate its parts, we've apprehended its truth. That's the good of the intellect. Okay? Uh, to the extent, uh, to the extent that uh, uh, we uh, 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 we find that uh, that uh, uh, that good possessed huh? in uh, in a a a, a, a magnitude huh? uh, that uh, that shocks our our senses huh? and. Uh, uh, possesses a kind of, of, of proportionality. Uh, uh, Saint Thomas says, "Well, that's beautiful." Uh, so the the good and the beautiful are a, a little bit different, and I'll go into that um, uh, in a little bit. Uh, but um, so um, the the perfection huh, of uh, of a being's act of existing, according to Saint Thomas. Huh, uh, gives to it what I uh, a, what I've called an, in our, our course on the one and the many a, a an intensive quantity a kind of of, of greatness of possession uh, ability to have huh? see uh, God according to Saint Thomas uh, creates the universe by causing imperfect likenesses of uh, of, of of the divine existence huh? God is perfect existence. Uh, so God creates the world by creating imperfect existences, huh? beings that imperfectly have uh, existence. Huh? Uh, and 
uh, that imperfection of the possession of existence, huh? that principle which imperfectly possesses existence huh? uh, through a multitude of uh, or plurality of parts, uh, uh, a, a, an act of existing and something receiving that act of existing, it's basically a principle of having huh? uh, in a limited way is what St. Thomas calls a form. Uh, the, um, so all the division, huh? uh, all the pluralization that is found within the universe, according to St. Thomas, is related to this imperfect possession or imp imperfect having huh? that, that uh, some pr pr privation, uh, which is a form, uh, uh, has in relationship to an act of existing. Um, the, um, that which is totally uh, perfect or complete is absolutely perfect, according to St. Thomas. Uh, uh, it's perfect simpliciter. Uh, the good adds to the meaning of ends or being, the idea of being perfect and complete. Right? Um, that which is not totally perfect or complete, is obviously not absolutely perfect. Uh, intellectually considered, uh, the, uh, he says, the concept of being precedes that of good. Uh, uh, it's what we the, the intellect first conceives. Uh, but causally considered, he says, that good precedes existence in this respect, that uh, for you to know that something is existing, you have to have a subject that's whole and is good, huh? that's generating an action that can cause you to be able to know it, cause us to be able to know it. Uh, but since only that which exists can be desired or desirable, the act, the what St. Thomas calls the essay of a thing, uh, causes an ends to be the act of all acts and the perfections of all perfections. Um, everything that exists is good, according to him, because God, who is absolutely good, causes all of the things. Existence is the actuality and what is actual in some way perfect uh, in everything. Um, the uh, while the idea of good chiefly refers to the idea of being as desired right, or as desirable, it also contains the ideas of efficient or formal cause because the act of causing starts with what will be caused or achieved last in the subject move to act. I talked about this before, huh? that the first act of an agent starts with an initial relation uh, a, a, a union, uh, a, uh, a, the, the fact that two things have been proportionately uh, uh, constituted so that they can relate, uh, they can unite. They've got limited, re limited receptivity and resistance toward one another uh, so that they, they're compatible or suitable. Uh, uh, the thing that is 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 being jo joined to, into this relationship with the power does not overpower uh, the faculty and destroy it. It's not too little, or it's not too much. Huh? So that the the, the, the two uh, 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 the, the plurality uh, uh, can be united into a composite whole. Uh, the um, the first act of an agent starts with this initial relation or influx into a thing, um, uh, and it's its last, even though it's its last act. Um, just like the inflamed piece of wood starts being inflamed by becoming re related to fire through heat. Uh, that's why Aristotle points out that the beginning of the relationship starts with qualification. Right? If you're unqualified, and why qualities are so important uh, to understanding action uh, in the universe, huh? real qualities in things are principles of relation. They're principles of receptivity and resistance. Uh, St. Thomas calls them intensive quantities. Huh? Uh, the extent to which uh, 
a thing cannot be totally resistant um, uh, uh, to something, uh, unable to, to some other thing, enables, enables this, this agent, this other form, to be received into the subject that it's, it's acting upon. Right? Uh, so the beginning uh, of, the, uh, of any action involves contact of a subject uh, with some sort of, of external stimulus, which St. Thomas is calling the form, uh, the, the formal object, uh, which uh, through the qualities of a thing is already present uh, uh, in a in a a um, uh, uh, in a um, a slight fashion at the very least uh, uh, as uh, a the 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 agency uh, that uh, is creating a harmonization and arrangement within the organization of the activity of a thing uh, that's why he says that the end uh, uh, is the rule uh, and the, and the measure uh, of the way in which a, a being proceeds toward the end. Uh, uh, because uh, the form uh, of a thing is, is nothing more than the final cause of a thing. Right? Like the fire uh, existing in the wood right? uh, that's inflaming it. Uh, or the soul existing in the body. Right? That's giving life to all of the parts of the body right? from the very beginning and coming to mature development uh, in its control over the different parts uh, of the body as uh, human beings become, uh, become older. Uh, in, uh, in a subject known, good and beauty have the same foundation for St. Thomas form. I mentioned beauty a little while ago and said I would get back to this. Form causes us to praise the good as beautiful. We first become aware of the notion of beauty as we do with respect to the notion of form with respect to shape. Right? Uh, the, um, uh, and uh, uh, we find something perfect huh, about the shape of something uh, uh, and we find it good. Uh, uh, we find the proportions uh, uh, especially delightful, right? Uh, and this, this the, according to St. Thomas, the intellectual faculty f uh, and the sense faculty uh, find especially uh, pleasing. Uh, and so um, the, um, there's a, a very close connection between beauty and good. Uh, a, 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 uh, the, the good of a, the, be the beauty of a thing consists in, in a, an intensity of, uh, of goodness within it, uh, oh, which overflows from the appetite into the intellect right? uh, and causes the intellect to, to recognize a kind of greatness uh, of, of organization in the operation, the harmonious operation of something. Uh, which uh, not only the intellect but the senses then uh, then find uh, delightful. So chiefly, good refers for Saint Thomas to what satisfies an appetite, and beauty refers to right proportions that satisfy all knowing faculties, uh, but chiefly the senses and overflow into the, 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 the concupiscible appetite, but, uh, uh, and, uh, which is the seat for pleasure in, in a, a physical thing. Um, so, once again, for St. Thomas to be good, something has to be perfect. Being perfect involves having everything necessary for existing according to the way of being, the, the power. Huh? Uh, the the intensive quantity greatness that a a um, a thing has to receive a form to be perfect and good a being has to have some power some capacity to receive it huh? and also to resist it somewhat the reception of the form presupposes uh, the reception of the organization a thing is going to have presupposes a, a, a proportionate power to possess the form. And in an organization, huh, uh, the principle of the, uh, the, the organizational unity 
uh, is chiefly uh, is 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 chiefly recognized in the harmony of the organization. Huh? The the uh, the good of the thing, huh? the good of the organization, uh, consists in the harmony of the organizational parts. That's that's how we first recognize the good in things, and we recognize that there's some sort of a principle uh, which Saint Thomas would call the form, which uh, uh, is uh, uh, is generating this kind of organizational unity with respect to its own maturity. Huh? The organizational maturity. Uh, the organization is uh, existing in the relationship uh, of the parts uh, to their harmonious and, and mature development. Huh? The good precisely is the organization uh, in its harmonious operation. Uh -huh. Um, finally, St. Thomas divides, following Aristotle, and, and Plato for that matter, to, uh, uh, dividing the good up into the enjoyable, the useful, uh, and the perfective, and we'll come back to that uh, later on uh, in the course. Uh, right now, I want to go into the goodness of God, um, and um, as the first efficient cause of everything, according to St. Thomas, God is the supreme good, the good of all, the, the cause of all perfections, and good in creatures. As an image of God, uh, every effect causes, possesses a finite, intensive quantity, greatness of perfection and goodness. That's what a form is for St. Thomas. Huh? A form is a limited way of having a divine likeness of perfection. Uh, God is absolutely perfect existence. Uh, a form is an imperfect likeness of perfect existence. Huh? It's a limited good, as Plato would call it. Uh, the, um, he says that a threefold per perfection exists in things according to the, the nature of a thing, according to its properties, and according to the extent to which it attains its end. Right? This prefold perfection in, exists in God uh, in an undivided sense, uh, where where God uh, God does not have to utilize properties, um, uh, what uh, Saint Thomas calls essential excellence, like quantity and quality, which are quantity and quality in a sense in a material thing, uh, uh, in order to be completely whole and exist perfectly whole. Uh, but the perfection of a finite thing, uh, a material thing, requ requires that it it have uh, the uh, a, a, have a, a certain uh, size of physical dimensions, a dimensive existence in space, uh, and that it has qualities that enable it uh, to exercise operations uh, uh, through its dimensive body. Huh? So. If a being can't act, huh? if, if it doesn't, if it doesn't have uh, the uh, a, a nature uh, that that equips it uh, with a proper size uh, for it to be the kind of creature which it is, according to its species, like ants aren't the same size as elephants. Huh? It's, it's it's due size uh, size limits, so, uh, a, a bare minimum and a maximum. Huh? Uh, of of uh, individual greatness uh, within species, uh, uh, and uh, if if you don't have the qualities uh, uh, that uh, uh, that are subjectified uh, in and through uh, those uh, those dimensions in place, uh, you can't be acted upon uh, by other things, and you can't act on other things. Uh, and if you're if you're not engaged in action, any action whatsoever, you're not existing. Uh, so without those essential properties, um, uh, you're, you're you're lacking a um, an essential uh, perfection as a material being. The um, so now because goodness exists in things to the extent that things are uh, that that they exist, uh, and since God causes existence, uh, uh, God has to be the cause of all goodness in things. Uh, the efficient cause of it, the formal cause of it, and the final cause of it, that, as the uh, as that which is causing the entire universe, God's the formal object huh, of the entire universe. Huh? 
Uh, God is that is that w that which makes everything move huh? uh, in a harmonious fashion as a, as one large genus. Huh? The created order is a genus. It consists of, uh, of of contrary opposites going from the highest kind of form, uh, which for Saint Thomas is this angelic form, a seraphim, huh? uh, down to the uh, uh, the most. Uh, uh, barely existent um, inanimate type of form which we would we would uh, consider to exist on subatomic levels huh? uh, 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 today huh? Be uh, beings that are barely beings uh, whatsoever uh, the um, uh, because no one creature uh, can adequately express uh, the perfection of God uh, and and the universe is created as a likeness of God uh, 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 St. Thomas explains the existence of diversity uh, in the universe uh, and plurality in the universe uh, to be due to the fact that uh, uh, God, as a, a, an absolutely good being, uh, seeks to share divine goodness. And God can only share divine goodness by sharing divine likeness. Uh, and as an extensive amount, uh, extensive amount as, as possible. Huh? Uh, as widely and as deeply as possible. So uh, this requires that a a um, uh, an order, huh? a division of forms exist, huh? uh, where where you have a kind of formal resistance huh? uh, 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 between these levels of forms that create different genera, right? uh, and uh, these. Um, these different genera uh, are divided by imperfect possessions. It's like it's like an order of corporations huh? <laughs> that is that is brought about uh, uh, through uh, distinctive operations that the the organizations perform based upon the perfection of the uh, of the organization uh, uh, to uh, to reflect. Uh, the perfection of action uh, of its uh, its chief executive order, ex executive officer, uh, uh, or or chief cause, um, forms for Saint Thomas are likenesses of God. Uh, they're imperfect ways of having existence, right? uh, and uh, these imperfect ways of having existence share that this imperfect way of having existence. Uh, uh, which is a, 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 a mo most uh, perfectly generated from within themselves, from their um, uh, from their own ability uh, to uh, to support their own activity without external assistance and aid huh? by a kind of internal liberty, huh? uh, and you you chiefly find this in its highest dimension. Huh? Uh, in the most perfect mirroring of divine uh, simplicity uh, in uh, intellectual beings. Uh, so, uh, Saint, even though St. Thomas thinks that you can't demonstrate the existence of angels, he thinks that the beauty of the universe um, uh, makes it reasonable uh, to take for granted uh, or, or to uh, uh, that take, take for granted the plausibility. Uh, of the the existence of the universe, even from the standpoint of natural reason, huh? uh, that um, the, uh, the that there's no way to expre express uh, or to explain huh? the order and the organization within the universe, um, uh, the the goodness of things, the beauty and the order, the harmony that exists within things, uh, unless you you. Uh, um, you posit the existence of a, uh, a, a an absolutely perfect being huh? uh, that uh, can explain how contrary opposites uh, can harmoniously cooperate huh? uh, to, uh, to 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 generate uh, a a common activity uh, uh, throughout an, an order of of uh, perfections of organization where where these are architectonically arranged. Huh? So the lower organization serves as a higher, serves as a means huh? uh, for the coming into existence and the the maintenance in, into uh, in existence of 
of higher or, of higher organizations, uh, and the higher organizations support the existence uh, and maintenance of the lower organizations. Um, the uh, every perfection, according uh, to Saint Thomas, in creatures exists in God, but exists in a uh, a more perfect way. Uh, the the form, as an imperfect likeness of God, causes the generic and specific order, a hierarchy of genera and species, huh? of organizational wholes huh? that generate oper operational uh, 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 operational effects uh, and exist through those operational effects. Huh? Uh, the, the unity of the organization doesn't exist apart from the actions of beings that imperfectly possess uh, the organizational whole. Like, the army exists in the general and in the private and in the corporal and sergeants and so forth. Huh? Uh, every organization exists within the, the operational parts huh? uh, that that give a, uh, a, a an order um, and and unity and wholeness uh, uh, to the organization uh, that consists in the initial relationship between. The, the qualified multitude and the aim that uh, uh, that uh, the the multitude is unequally related to um, the so the form of a composite whole is a subject's end fully realized in the subject through the orderly arrangement of its parts uh, it's it's a kind of harmonization. Um, that that overwhelms huh? as it truly develops uh, uh, the the whole. It exists in the whole as a principle uniting all the parts to constitute a whole as a principle of beauty and goodness. Uh, uh, so uh, within every organization, uh, uh, there is a principle of harmony and order, uh, which gives to which gives to that whole its unity. And without without the relation the unequal relationship of parts that are that are that constitute a communications network uh, in relationship to, to to some cooperative activity uh, that they are receiving into themselves and distributing throughout themselves in a communications network, um, uh, there uh, there is no uh, organizational whole. Uh, uh, organizations wouldn't wouldn't be wouldn't exist. How the order and harmony of parts existing among diverse things causes in them a kind of beauty um, is is due to the fact that the uh, uh, this harmony is proportionate, huh? is suitable, huh? that the different parts. Are related in such a way as they they, they do not excessively resist, huh? or, or or too too much overly uh, re, uh, receptive uh, to um, uh, the operations of uh, of each other. Right? Now, um, the the way this this is achieved is through uh, through inequality. Uh, that uh, according to St. Thomas, God rules the universe uh, uh, by having superiors in some way uh, um, uh, regulate the behavior of beings, of stronger beings uh, helping uh, or weaker beings uh, to cooperate right? uh, so, so that uh, they can engage in, in in a kind of complementary activity uh, to 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 um, um, uh, achieve a kind of of, uh, of organizational perfection huh? uh, the uh, this inequality of perfection in having huh? goodness is what St Thomas considers to be the origin of uh, all plurality, diversity, difference, and order in all genera and species. Huh? It's an inequality of possessing perfection in goodness right? that uh, explains uh, all the differences uh, in the universe for St. Thomas. Uh, and that's chiefly found in and through the form of a thing 
which receives and possesses existence huh? uh, in a uh, in unequal ways. In in an angel, for Saint, for Saint Thomas, the angelic form is able completely and totally huh, to hold on to existence, huh? so that once it receives it, it can't never cease to be. Uh, uh, so that it uh, 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 there's nothing internal uh, to, to you know to to cause it to lose lose existence, but uh, material things, uh, uh, according to Saint Thomas, uh, uh, are imperfect as forms. Uh, they're imperfect uh, as as receivers, uh, as being able to have uh, existence, uh, and so um, the. Um, uh, this is why human beings and other uh, uh, material beings come into existence and go out of existence. But the point here is, is that for St. Thomas, the forms of things are, uh, are diversified as the enabling means for receiving perfections. Huh? Matter is not. Some people thought uh, uh, that matter is the chief principle of diversification, for explaining differences in things. Matter makes things different. Forms makes them, make them the same. Uh, but according to St. Thomas, uh, it, it's the form of a thing uh, uh, that's the chief cause of diversification because God's the chief cause of diversification. Huh? Uh, and, and, and the act of creation is the first act of diversification. Huh? It separates being from non-being. Huh? So if you, if you, ask, if you, you might ask an ancient Greek, what's the chief cause of differences in things? And the ancient Greek will say it's the matter of things. Matter causes them to be different. St. Thomas would say, no, God causes them to be different, uh, strictly speaking. Huh? Um, as, a, as you might say, a remote cause, but the proximate cause is the form, the form of things. Uh, even as the first creation, the angelic beings uh, are, are the first creatures. Uh, so they would be the cause of diversification. It's only in relationship to form uh, that we know the matter of something or, or that the matter of something can in some way contribute to division. Uh, the, uh, uh, now, St. Thomas is teaching on, uh, on uh, the way in which matter contributes to the division of things uh, is... Um, is, is a little bit complicated, uh, and uh, uh, it um, it's it's based upon uh, uh, the uh, the notion that strictly speaking, a matter um, uh, in and of itself um, uh, cannot cause uh, cause diversification. Uh, it can only do so in relationship to uh, to forms. Uh, and there are a series of diversifications that occur within a physical thing, but I'm not going to go into all of those uh, because uh, the um, uh, uh, it, um, it it's not necessary for you to understand in order to understand the basic principle that he's talking about uh, that it's it's chiefly the form of the thing uh, that is the cause of its. Um, uh, its difference, its differences, and its divisions, uh, and matter contributes to that by being receptive, huh? uh, being proportionate uh, to assuming or taking on uh, the kind of a form uh, which is, and, and the kind of harmony, huh? uh, the kind of organization that exists within a thing. So I'm going to leave off with that.